section twenty three of the lane that had no turning this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the lane that had no turning and other tales concerning the people of pontiac by gilbert parker the baron of beauregard the manor house at beauregard monsieur ah certainly i mind it very well it was the first in quebec and there are many tales it had a chapel and a gallows its baron he had the power of life and death and the right of the seigneur you understand which he used only once and then what trouble it made for him and the woman and the barony and the parish and all the country what is the whole story la rue said medallion who had spent months in the seigneur's company stalking game and tales and legends of the st lawrence la rue spoke english very well his mother was english mais i do not know for sure but the abbe fronton he and i were snowed up together in that same house which now belongs to the church and in the big fireplace where we sat on a bench toasting our knees and our bacon he told me the tale as he knew it he was a great scholar there was none greater he had found papers in the wall of the house and from the government chest he got more then there were the tales handed down and the records of the church for she knew the true story of every man that has come to new france from first to last so because i have a taste for tales and gave him some he told me of the baron of beauregard and that time he took the right of the seigneur and the end of it all of course it was a hundred and fifty years ago when bigot was intendant ah what a rascal was that bigot robber and deceiver he never stood by a friend and never fought fair a foe so the abbe said well beauregard was no longer young he had built the manor house he had put up his gallows he had his vassals he had been made a lord he had quarrelled with bigot and had conquered but at great cost for bigot had such power and the governor had trouble enough to care for himself against bigot though he was beauregard's friend well there was a good lump of a fellow who had been a soldier and he picked out a girl in the seigneury of beauregard to make his wife it is said the girl herself was not set for the man for she was of finer stuff than the peasants about her and showed it but her father and mother had a dozen other children and what was this girl this falice to do she said yes to the man the time was fixed for the marriage and it came along so at the very hour of the wedding beauregard came by for the church was in mending and he had given leave it should be in his own chapel well he rode by just as the bride was coming out with the man garoche when beauregard saw felice he gave a whistle then spoke in his throat reined up his horse and got down he fastened his eyes on the girls a strange look passed between them he had never seen her before but she had seen him often and when he was gone had helped the housekeepers with his rooms she had carried away with her a stray glove of his of course it sounds droll and they said of her when all came out that it was wicked but evil is according to a man's own heart and the girl had hid this glove as she hid whatever was in her soul hid it even from the priest well the baron looked and she looked and he took off his hat stepped forward and kissed her on the cheek she turned pale as a ghost and her eyes took the color that her cheeks lost when he stepped back he looked close at the husband what is your name he said garouche monsieur le baron was the reply garouche garouche he said eyeing him up and down you have been a soldier yes monsieur le baron 
you have served with me against you monsieur le baron when bigot came fighting better against me than for me said the baron speaking to himself so he had so strong a voice that what he said could be heard by those near him that is those who were tall for he was six and a half feet with legs and shoulders like a bull he stooped and stroked the head of his hound for a moment and all the people stood and watched him wondering what next at last he said and what part played you in that siege garouche garouche looked troubled but answered it was in the way of duty monsieur le baron i with five others captured the relief party sent from your cousin the seigneur of vadrome oh said the baron looking sharp you were in that were you then you know what happened to the young marmette garouche trembled a little but drew himself up and said monsieur le baron i tried to kill the intendant there was no other way what part played you in that garouche some trembled for they knew the truth and they feared the mad will of the baron i ordered the firing party monsieur le baron he answered the baron's eyes got fierce and his face hardened but he stooped and drew the ears of the hound through his hand softly marmette was my cousin's son and had lived with me he said a brave lad and he had a nice hatred of vileness else he had not died a strange smile played on his lips for a moment then he looked at felice steadily who can tell what was working in his mind war is war he went on and bigot was your master garouche but a man pays for his master's sins this way or that yet i would not have it different no not a jot then he turned round to the crowd raised his hat to the cure who stood on the chapel steps once more looked steadily at felice and said you shall all come to the manor house and have your feastings there and we will drink to the homecoming of the fairest woman in my barony with that he turned round bowed to felice put on his hat got the bridle through his arm and led his horse to the manor house this was in the afternoon of course whether they wished it or not garouche and felice could not refuse and the people were glad enough for they would have a free hand at meat and wine the baron being liberal of table and it was as they guessed for though the time was so short the people at beauregard soon had the tables heavy with food and drink it was just at the time of candle lighting the baron came in and gave a toast to the dwellers in eden to-night he said eden against the time of the angel and the sword i do not think that any except the cure and the woman understood and she maybe only because a woman feels the truth about a thing even when her brain does not after they had done shouting to his toast he said a good night to all and they began to leave the cure among the first to go with a troubled look on his face as the people left the baron said to garouche and felice a moment with me before you go the woman started for she thought of one thing and garouche started for he thought of another the siege of beauregard and the killing of young marmette but they followed the baron to his chamber coming in he shut the door on them then he turned to garouche you will accept the roof and bed of beauregard to-night my man he said and come to me here at nine to-morrow morning garouche stared hard for an instant stay here said garouche felice and me stay here in the manor monsieur le baron here even here garouche so good night to you said the baron garouche turned towards the girl then come felice he said and reached out his hand your room shall be shown you at once the baron added softly the ladies at her pleasure then a cry burst from garouche and he sprang forward but the baron waved him back stand off he said and let the lady choose between us she is my wife said garouche 
i am your seigneur said the other and there is more than that he went on for damn me she is too fine stuff for you and the church shall untie what she has tied to-day at that felice fainted and the baron caught her as she fell he laid her on a couch keeping an eye on garouche the while loose her gown he said while i get brandy then he turned to the cupboard poured liquor and came over garouche had her dress open at the neck and bosom and was staring at something on her breast the baron saw also stooped with a strange sound in his throat and picked it up my glove he said and on her wedding day he pointed there on the table is its mate fished this morning from my hunting coat a pair the governor gave me you see man you see her choice as that he stooped and put some brandy to her lips garouche drew back sick and numb he did nothing only stared valise came to herself soon and when she felt her dress open gave a cry garouche could have killed her then when he saw her shudder from him as if afraid over towards the baron who held the glove in his hand and said see garouche you had better go in the next room they will tell you where to sleep to-morrow as i said you will meet me here we shall have things to say you and i ah that baron he had a queer mind but in truth he loves a woman as you shall see garouche got up without a word went to the door and opened it the eyes of the baron and the woman following him for there was a devil in his eye in the other room there were men waiting and he was taken to a chamber and locked in you can guess what that night must have been to him what was it to the baron and felice asked medallion monsieur what do you think beauregard had never had an eye for women loving his hounds fighting quarrelling doing wild strong things so all at once he was face to face with a woman who has the look of love in her face who was young and fine of body so the abbe said and was walking to marriage at her father's will and against her own carrying the baron's glove in her bosom what should beauregard do but no ah no monsieur not as you think not quite wild with a bit in his teeth yes but at heart well here was the one woman for him he knew it all in a minute and he would have her once and for all and till death should come their way and so he said to her as he raised her she drawing back afraid her heart hungering for him yet fear in her eyes and her fingers trembling as she softly pushed him from her you see she did not quite know what was in his heart she was the daughter of a tenant vassal who had lived in the family of the grand seigneur in her youth the friend of his child that was all and that was where she got her manners and her mind she got on her feet and said monsieur le baron you will let me go to my husband i cannot stay here oh you are great you are noble you would not make me sorry make me hate myself and you i have only one thing in the world of any price you would not steal my happiness he looked at her steadily in the eyes and said will it make you happy to go to garouche she raised her hands and wrung them god knows i am his wife she said helplessly and he loves me and god knows god knows said the baron it is all a question of whether one shall feed and two go hungry or two gather and one have the stubble shall not he stand in the stubble what has he done to merit you what would he do you are for the master not the man for love not the feeding on for the manor house and the hunt not the cottage and the loom she broke into tears her heart thumping in her throat i am for what the church did for me this day she said oh sir i pray you forgive me and let me go do not punish me but forgive me and let me go i was wicked to wear your glove wicked wicked but no was his reply 
i shall not forgive you so good a deed and you shall not go and what the church did for you this day she shall undo by all the saints she shall you came sailing into my heart this hour past on a strong wind and you shall not slide out on an ebb tide i have you here as your seigneur but i have you here as a man who will he sat down by her at that point and whispered softly in her ear at which she gave a little cry which had both gladness and pain surely even that he said catching her to his breast and the baron of burgard never broke his word what should be her reply does not a woman when she truly loves always believe is that the great sign she slid to her knees and dropped her head into the hollow of his arm i do not understand these things she said but i know that the other was death and this is life and yet i know too for my heart says so that the end the end will be death tut tut my flower my wild rose he said of course the end of all is death but we will go a-maying first come october and let the world break over us when it must we are for maying now my rose of all the world it was as if he meant more than he said as if he saw what would come in that october which all new friends never forgot when as he said the world broke over them the next morning the baron called garouche to him the man was like some mad buck harried by the hounds and he gnashed his teeth behind his shut lips the baron eyed him curiously yet kindly too as well he might for when was ever man to hear such a speech as came to garouche the morning after his marriage garouche the baron said having waved his men away as you see the lady made her choice and for ever you and she have said your last farewell in this world for the wife of the baron of beauregard can have nothing to say to garouche the soldier at that garouche snarled out the wife of the baron of beauregard that is a lie to shame all hell the baron wound the lash of a riding whip round and round his fingers quietly and said it is no lie my man but the truth garouche eyed him savagely and growled the church made her my wife yesterday and you 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 ah you who had all you with your money and place which could get all easy you take the one thing i have you the grand seigneur are only a common robber ah jesus if you would but fight me the baron very calm said first garouche the lady was only your wife by a form which the church shall set aside it could never have been a true marriage secondly it is no stealing to take from you what you did not have i took what was mine remember the glove for the rest to fight you no my churl you know that's impossible you may shoot me from behind a tree or a rock but sorting with you come come a pretty gossip for the court then why wish a fight where would you be as you stood before me you the baron stretched himself up and smiled down at garouche you have your life man take it and go to the farthest corner of new france and show not your face here again if i find you ever again in beauregard i will have you whipped from parish to parish here is money for you good gold coins take them and go garouche got still and cold as stone he said in a low harsh voice monsieur le baron you are a common thief a wolf a snake such men as you come lower than judas as god has an eye to see you shall pay all one day i do not fear you nor your men nor your gallows you are a jackal and the woman has a filthy heart a ditch of shame the baron drew up his arm like lightning and the lash of his whip came singing across garouche's pale face where it passed a red welt rose but the man never stirred 
the arm came up again but a voice behind the baron said ah no no not again there stood felice both men looked at her i have heard garouche she said he does not judge me right my heart is no filthy ditch of shame but it was breaking when i came from the altar with him yesterday yet i would have been a true wife to him after all a ditch of shame ah garouche garouche you have said you loved me and that nothing could change you the baron said to her why have you come felice i forbade you oh my lord she answered i feared for you both when men go mad because of women a devil enters into them the baron taking her hand said permit me and he led her to the door for her to pass out she looked back sadly at garouche standing for a minute very still then garouche said i command you come with me you are my wife she did not reply but shook her head at him then he spoke out high and fierce may no child be born to you may a curse fall on you may your field be barren and your horses and cattle die may you never see nor hear good things may the waters leave their courses to drown you and the hills their bases to bury you and no hand lay you in decent graves the woman put her hand to her ears and gave a little cry and the baron pushed her gently on and closed the door after her then he turned on garouche have you said all you wish he asked for if not say on and then go and go so far that you cannot see the sky that covers beauregard we are even now we can cry quits but that i have a little injured you you should be done for instantly but hear me if i ever see you again my gallows shall end you straight your tongue has been gross before the mistress of this manor i will have it torn out if it so much as syllables her name to me or to the world again she is dead to you go and go for ever he put a bag of money on the table but garouche turned away from it and without a word left the room and the house and the parish and said nothing to any man of the evils that had come to him but what talk was there and what dreadful things were said at first that garouche had sold his wife to the baron that he had been killed and his wife taken that the baron kept him a prisoner in a cellar under the manor house and all the time there was felice with the baron very quiet and sweet and fine to see and going to chapel every day and to mass on sundays which no one could understand any more than they could see why she should be called the baroness of beauregard for had they not all seen her married to garouche and there were many people who thought her vile yet truly at heart she was not so not at all then it was said that there was to be a new marriage that the church would let it be so doing and undoing and doing again but weeks and months went by and it was never done for powerful as the baron was bigot the intendant was powerful also and fought the thing with all his might the baron went to quebec to see the bishop and the governor and so promises were made nothing was done it must go to the king and then to the pope and from the pope to the king again and so on and the months and the years went by as they waited and with them came no child to the manor house of beauregard that was the only sad thing that and the waiting so far as man could see for never were man and woman truer to each other than these and never was a lady of the manor kinder to the poor or a lord freer of hand to his vassals he would bluster sometimes and string a peasant up by the heels but his gallows were never used and what was much in the minds of the people the cure did not refuse the woman the sacrament at last the baron fierce because he knew that bigot was the cause of the great delay so that he might not call felice his wife seized a transport on the river which had been sent to brutally levy upon a poor gentleman and when bigot's men resisted shut them down 
then bigot sent against beauregard a company of artillery and some soldiers of the line the guns were placed on a hill looking down on the manor house across the little river in the evenings the cannons arrived and in the morning the fight was to begin the guns were loaded and everything was ready at the manor all was making ready also and the baron had no fear but felice's heart was heavy she knew not why eugene she said if anything should happen nonsense my felice he answered what should happen if if you were taken were killed she said nonsense my rose he said again i shall not be killed but if i were you should be at peace here ah no no she said never life to me is only possible with you i have had nothing but you none of those things which give peace to other women none but i have been very happy oh yes very happy and god forgive me eugene i cannot regret and i never have but it has been always and always my prayer that when you die i may die with you at the same moment for i cannot live without you and besides i would like to go to the good god with you to speak for us both for oh i loved you i loved you and i love you still my husband my adored he stooped he was so big and she but of middle height kissed her and said see my felice i am of the same mind we have been happy in life and we could well be happy in death together so they sat long long into the night and talked to each other of the days they had passed together of cheerful things she trying to comfort herself and he trying to bring smiles to her lips at last they said good night and he lay down in his clothes and after a few moments she was sleeping like a child but he could not sleep for he lay thinking of her and of her life how she had come from humble things and fitted in with the highest at last at break of day he arose and went outside he looked up at the hill where bigot's two guns were men were already stirring there one man was standing beside the gun and another not far behind of course the baron could not know that the man behind the gunner said yes you may open the dance with an early salute and the baron smiled up boldly at the hill and went into the house and stole to the bed of his wife to kiss her before he began the day's fighting he looked at her a moment standing over her and then stooped and softly put his lips to hers at that moment the gunner up on the hill used the match and an awful thing happened with a loud roar the whole hillside of rock and gravel and sand split down not ten feet in front of the gun moved with horrible swiftness upon the river filled its bed turned it from its course and sweeping on swallowed the manor house of beauregard there had been a crack in the hill the water of the river had sapped its foundations it needed only this shock to send it down and so as the woman wished the same hour for herself and the man and when at last their prison was opened by the hands of bigot's men they were found cheek to cheek bound in the sacred marriage of death but another had gone the same road for at the awful moment beside the bursting gun the dying gunner garouche lifted up his head saw the loose travelling hill and said with his last breath the waters drown them and the hills bury them and uh, he had his way with them and after that perhaps the great god had his way with him perhaps end of section twenty three the baron of beauregard Section 24 of The Lane That Had No Turning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Lane That Had No Turning 
and other tales concerning the people of pontiac by gilbert parker the golden pipes they hung all bronzed and shining on the side of margath mountain the tall and perfect pipes of the organ which was played by some son of god when the world was young at least hepnon the cripple said this was so when he was but a child and when he got older he said that even now a golden music came from the pipes at sunrise and sunset and no one laughed at hepnon for you could not look into the dark warm eyes dilating with his fancies nor see the transparent temper of his face the look of the dreamer over all without believing him and reproving your own judgment you felt that he had travelled ways you could never travel that he had had dreams beyond you that his fanciful spirit had had adventures you would give years of your dull life to know and yet he was not made only as women are made fragile and trembling in his nerves for he was strong of arm and there was no place in the hills to be climbed by a venturesome man which he could not climb with crutch and shrivelled leg and he was a gallant horseman riding with his knees and one foot in stirrup his crutch slung behind him it may be that was why rough men listened to his fancies about the golden pipes indeed they would go out at sunrise and look across to where the pipes hung taking the rosy glory of the morning and steal away alone at sunset and in some lonely spot lean out towards the framing instrument to hear if any music rose from them the legend that one of the mighty men of the kaimash hills came here to play with invisible hands the music of the first years of the world became a truth though a truth that none could prove and by and by no man ever travelled the valley without taking off his hat as he passed the golden pipes so had a cripple with his whimsies worked upon the land then too perhaps his music had to do with it as a child he had only a poor concertina but by it he drew the traveller and the mountaineer and the worker in the valley to him like a magnet some touch of the mysterious some sweet fantastical melody in all he played charmed them even when he gave them old familiar airs from the concertina he passed to the violin and his skill and mastery over his followers grew and then there came a notable day when up over a thousand miles of country a melodeon was brought him then a wanderer a minstrel outcast from a far country taking refuge in those hills taught him and there was one long year of loving labor together and merry whisperings between the two and secret drawings and worship of the golden pipes and then the minstrel died and left hepnon alone and now they said that hepnon tried to coax out of the old melodeon the music of the golden pipes but a look of sorrow grew upon his face and stayed for many months then there came a change and he went into the woods and began working there in the perfect summer weather and the tale went abroad that he was building an organ so that he might play for all who came the music he heard on the golden pipes for they had ravished his ear since childhood and now he must know the wonderful melodies all by heart they said with consummate patience hepnon dried the wood and fashioned it into long tuneful tubes beating out soft metal got from the forge in the valley to case the lips of them tanning the leather for the bellows stretching it and exposing all his work to the sun of early morning which gave every fibre and valve a rich sweetness like a sound fruit of autumn people also said that he set all the pieces out at sunrise and sunset that the tone of the golden pipes might pass into them so that when the organ was built each part should be saturated with such melody as it had drawn in according to its temper and its fibre so the building of the organ went on and a year passed and then another and it was summer again and soon hepnon began to build also while yet it was sweet weather a home for his organ a tall nest of cedar added to his father's house and in it every piece of wood and every board had been made ready by his own hands and set in the sun and dried slowly to a healthy soundness and he used no nails of metal 
but wooden pins of the ironwood or hickory tree and it was all polished and there was no paint or varnish anywhere and when you spoke in this nest your voice sounded pure and strong at last the time came when piece by piece the organ was set up in its home and as the days and weeks went by and autumn drew to winter and the music of the golden pipes stole down the flumes of snow to their ardent lover and spring came with its sap and small purple blossoms and yellow apples of mandrake and summer stole on luxurious and dry the face of hepnon became thinner and thinner a strange deep light shone in his eyes and all his person seemed to exhale a kind of glow he ceased to ride to climb to lift weights with his strong arms as he had poor cripple been once so proud to do a delicacy came upon him and more and more he withdrew himself to his organ and to those lofty and lonely places where he could see and hear the golden pipes boom softly over the valley at last it was all done even to the fine carved stool of cedar whereon he should sit when he played his organ never yet had he done more than sound each note as he made it trying it softening it by tender devices with the wood but now the hour is come when he should gather down the soul of the golden pipes to his fingers and give to the ears of the world the song of the morning stars the music of jubal and his comrades the affluent melody to which the sons of men in the first days paced the world in time with the thoughts of god for days he lived alone in the cedar house and who may know what he was doing dreaming listening or praying then the word went through the valley and the hills that one evening he would play for all who came and that day was toussaint or the feast of all souls so they came both old and young and they did not enter the house but waited outside upon the mossy rocks or sat among the trees and watched the heavy sun roll down and the golden pipes flame in the light of evening far beneath in the valley the water ran lightly on but there came no sound from it none from anywhere only a general pervasive murmur quieting to the heart now they heard a note coming from the organ a soft low sound that seemed to rise out of the good earth and mingle with the vibrant air the song of birds the whisper of trees and the murmuring water then came another and another note then chords and chords upon these and by and by rolling tides of melody until as it seemed to the listeners the air ached with the incomparable song and men and women wept and children hid their heads in the laps of their mothers and young men and maidens dreamed dreams never to be forgotten for one short hour the music went on then twilight came presently the sounds grew fainter and exquisitely painful and now a low sob seemed to pass through all the heart of the organ and then silence fell and in the sacred pause hepnon came out among them all pale and desolate he looked at them a minute most sadly and then lifting up his arms towards the golden pipes now hidden in the dusk he cried low and brokenly oh my god give me back my dream then his crutch seemed to give way beneath him and he sank upon the ground faint and gasping they raised him up and women and men whispered in his ear ah the beautiful beautiful music have known but he only said oh my god oh my god give me back my dream when he had said it thrice he turned his face to where his organ was in the cedar house and then his eyes closed and he fell asleep and they could not wake him but at sunrise the next morning a shiver passed through him and then a cold quiet stole over him and hepnon and the music of the golden pipes departed from the voshti hills and came again no more end of section twenty four
Section 25 of The Lane That Had No Turning This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker the guardian of the fire height unto height answereth knowledge his was the first watch the farthest fire for shaknon hill towered above the great gulf and looked back also over thirty leagues of country towards the great city there came a time again when all the land was threatened from sovereign lands far off two fleets were sailing hard to reach the wide basin before the walled city the one to save the other to destroy if tinoir the guardian of the fire should sight the destroying fleet he must light two fires on shaknon hill and then at the edge of the wide basin in a treacherous channel the people would send out fire rafts to burn the ships of the foe. Five times in the past had Tinoir been the guardian of the fire, and five times had the people praised him, but praise and his scanty wage were all he got. The hut in which he lived with his wife on another hill, ten miles from Shaknon, had but two rooms, and their little farm and the garden gave them only enough to live, no more. Elsewhere there was good land in abundance, but it had been said years ago to Tinoir by the great men that he should live not far from Shaknon, so that in times of peril he might guard the fire and be the sentinel for all the people. Perhaps Tinoir was too dull to see that he was giving all and getting naught, that while he waited and watched he was always poor and also was getting old there was no house or home within fifty miles of them and only now and then some wandering indians lifted the latch and drew in beside their hearth or a good priest with a soul of love for others came and said mass in the room where a little calvary had been put up Two children had come and gone, and Tinoir and Delice had dug their graves and put them in a warm nest of maple leaves, and afterwards lived upon the memories of them. But after these two children came no more, and Tinoir and Delice grew close and closer to each other, coming to look alike in face as they had long been alike in mind and feeling. None ever lived nearer to nature than they, and wild things grew to be their friends, so that you might see Delice at her door, tossing crumbs with one hand to birds, and with the other bits of meat to foxes, martins, and wild dogs that came and went unharmed by them. Tinoir shot no wild animals for profit, only for food, and for skins and furs to wear. Because of this, he was laughed at by all who knew, save the priest of St. Sulpice, who on Easter Day, when a little man came yearly to Mass over two hundred miles of country, praised him to his people and made much of him, though Tinoir was not vain enough to see it. When word came down the river and up over the hills to Tinoir that war was come, and that he must go to watch for the hostile fleet and for the friendly fleet as well he made no murmur though it was the time of harvest and delice had had a sickness from which she was not yet recovered go my tinoir said delice with a little smile and i will reap the grain if your eyes are sharp you shall see my bright sickle moving in the sun 
There is the churning of the milk, too, Dalys, answered Tinoir. You are not strong, and sometimes the butter comes slow, and there's the milking also. Strength is coming to me fast, Tinoir, she said, and drew herself up, but her dress lay almost flat on her bosom. Tinoir took her arm and felt it above the elbow. It is like the muscle of a little child, he said. But I will drink those bottles of red wine the governor sent the last time you watched the fire on Shaknon, she said, brightening up and trying to cheer him. He nodded, for he saw what she was trying to do, and said, And a little of the gentian and orange root three times a day, ah, Delis? After arranging for certain signs by little fires, which they were to light upon the hills, and so speak with each other, they said, Good day, Delis, and good day, Tinoir, drank a glass of the red wine, and added, Thank the good God. Then Tinoir wiped his mouth with his sleeve and went away, leaving Delis with a broken glass at her feet, and a look in her eyes which it is well that Tinoir did not see. But as he went, he was thinking how, the night before, Delis had lain with her arm around his neck, hour after hour as she slept, as she did before they ever had a child, that even in her sleep she kissed him as she used to kiss him, before he brought her away from the parish of St. Genevieve to be his wife. And the more he thought about it, the happier he became, and more than once he stopped and shook his head in pleased retrospection. And Delise thought of it too as she hung over the churn, her face drawn and tired and shining with sweat, and she shook her head, and tears came into her eyes, for she saw further into things than Tinoir. And once, as she passed his coat on the wall, she rubbed it softly over her hand, as she might his curly head when he lay beside her. From Shaknon, Tinoir watched, but of course, he could never see her bright sickle shining, and he could not know whether her dress still hung loose upon her breast or whether the flesh of her arms was still like a child's. If all was well with Delice, a little fire should be lighted at the house door, just at the going down of the sun, and it should be at once put out. If she were ill, a fire should be lit, and then put out two hours after sundown. If she should be ill beyond any help, this fire should burn on till it went out. Day after day, Tenoir, as he watched for the coming fleet, saw the fire lit at sundown and then put out. But one night the fire did not come till two hours after sundown, and it was put out at once. He fretted much, and he prayed that Delice might be better, and he kept to his post, looking for the fleet of the foe. Evening after evening was this other fire lighted, and then put out at once, and a great longing came to him to leave this guarding of the fire and go to her. For half a day, he said, just for half a day. But in that half day, the fleet might pass, and then it would be said that Tinoir had betrayed his country. At last sleep left him, and he fought a demon night and day, and always he remembered Delisa's arm about his neck and her kisses that last night they were together. Twice he started away from his post to go to her, but before he had gone a hundred paces, he came back. At last one afternoon he saw ships not far off, rounding the great cape in the gulf, and after a time at sunset, he knew by their shape it was the fleet of the foe, and so he lighted his great fires, and they were answered leagues away, towards the city by another beacon. Two hours after sunset of this day, the fire in front of Tinoir's home was lighted, and was not put out, and Tinoir sat and watched it till it died away. So he lay in the light of his own great war fire till morning, for he could not travel at night 
and then, his duty over, he went back to his home. He found Delise lying beside the ashes of her fire, past hearing all he said in her ear, unheeding the kiss he set upon her lips. Two nights afterwards, coming back from laying her beside her children, he saw a great light in the sky towards the city, as of a huge fire. When the courier came to him, bearing the governor's message and the praise of the people, and told of the enemy's fleet destroyed by the fire rafts, he stared at the man, then turned his head to a place where a pine cross showed against the green grass and said, Delise, my wife, is dead. You have saved your country, Tenoir, answered the courier kindly. What is that to me, he said, and fondled the rosary Delise used to carry when she lived, and he would speak to the man no more. End of section 25「Section 26 of The Lane That Had No Turning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Lane That Had No Turning, in Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac, by Gilbert Parker. By that place called Paraventure. By that place called Peradventure, in the Voshti Hills, dwelt Golgothar, the strong man, who, it was said, could break an iron pot with a blow, or pull a tall sapling from the ground. If I had a hundred men so strong, said Golgothar, I would go and conquer Nuni, the city of our foes. Because he had not the hundred men, he did not go, and Nuni still sent insults to the country of Golgothar, and none could travel safe between the capitals, and Golgothar was sorry. If I had a hundred men so strong, said Golgothar, I would build a dike to keep the floods back from the people crowded on the lowlands. Because he had not the hundred men, now and again the floods came down and swept the poor folk out to sea or laid low their habitations and golgothar pitied them if i had a hundred men so strong said golgothar i would clear the wild boar from the forest that the children should not fear to play among the trees because he had not the hundred men the graves of children multiplied and countless mothers sat by empty beds and mourned, and Golgothar put his head between his knees in trouble for them. If I had a hundred men so strong, said Golgothar, I would with great stones mend the broken pier, and the bridge between the islands should not fall. Because he had not the hundred men, at last the bridge gave way, and a legion of the king's army were carried to the whirlpool where they fought in vain and golgothar made a feast of remembrance to them and tears dripped on his beard when he said hail and farewell if i had a hundred men so strong said golgothar i would go against the walls of chains our rebels built and break them one by one because he had not the hundred men, the chain walls blocked the only pass between the hills, and so cut in two the kingdom, and they who pined for corn went wanting, and they who wished for fish went hungry. And Golgothar, brooding, said his heart bled for his country. If I had a hundred men so strong, said Golgothar, I would go among the thousand brigands of Mernin and bring them again the beloved daughter of our city. Because he had not the hundred men, the beloved lady languished in her prison, 
for the brigands asked as ransom the city of Talgon, which they hated, and Golgothar carried in his breast a stone image she had given him, and for very grief let no man speak her name before him. If I had a hundred men so strong, said Golgothar one day, standing on a great point of land and looking down the valley. As he said it, he heard a laugh, and looking down, he saw Sapphire, or Laugh of the Hills, as she was called. A long staff of ironwood was in her hands, with which she jumped the dikes and streams and rocky fissures. In her breast were yellow roses, and there was a tuft of pretty feathers in her hair. She reached up and touched him on the breast with her staff. Then she laughed again and sang a snatch a song in mockery. I am a king, I have no crown, I have no throne to sit in. Pull me up, boy, she said. She wound a leg about the staff, and taking hold, he drew her up as if she had been a feather. If I had a hundred mouths, I would kiss you for that, she said, still mocking. But having only one, I'll give it to the cat and weep for Golgothar. Silly jade, he said, and turned towards his tent. As they passed a slippery and dangerous place, where was one strong solitary tree, she suddenly threw a noose over him, drew it fast, and sprang far out over the precipice into the air. Even as she did so, he jumped behind the tree and clasped it, else on the slippery place he would have gone over with her. The rope came taut, and presently he drew her up again to safety. And while she laughed at him and mocked him, he held her tight under his arm and carried her to his lodge, where he let her go. Why did you do it, devil's madcap, he said. Why didn't you wait for the hundred men so strong, she laughed. Why did you jump behind the tree? If I had a hundred men high o, I would buy my corn for a penny a gill. If I had a hundred men or so, I would dig a grave for the maid of the hill, high o. He did not answer her, but stirred the soup in the pot and tasted it, and hung a great piece of meat over the fire. Then he sat down, and only once did he show anger as she mocked him, and that was when she thrust her hand into his breast, took out the little stone image, and said, if a little stone god had a hundred hearts, would a little stone goddess trust in one? Then she made as if she would throw it into the fire. But he caught her hand and crushed it, so that she cried out for pain and anger, and said, Brute of iron, go break the post in the brigand's prison house, but leave a poor girl's wrist alone. If I had a hundred men, she added, mocking wildly again, and then, springing at him, put her two thumbs at the corner of his eyes, and cried, Stir a hand, and out they will come, your eyes for my bones. He did not stir till her fury was gone. Then he made her sit down and eat with him, and afterwards she said softly to him, and without a laugh, why should the people say, Golgothar is our shame, for he has great strength, and yet he does nothing but throw great stones for sport into the sea? He had the simple mind of a child, and he listened to her patiently, and at last got up and began preparing for a journey, cleaning all his weapons and gathering them together. She understood him, and she said, with a little laugh like music, One strong man is better than a hundred. A little key will open a great door easier than a hundred hammers. What is the strength of a hundred bullocks without this? She added, 
tapping him on the forehead. Then they sat down and talked together quietly for a long time, and at sunset she saw him start away upon great errands. Before two years had gone, Nuni, the city of their foes, was taken. The chain wall of the rebels opened to the fish and corn of the poor. The children wandered in the forest without fear of wild boars. The dike was built to save the people in the lowlands, and Golgothar carried to the castle the king had given him the daughter of the city, freed from Mernin. If Golgothar had a hundred wives, said a voice to the strong man as he entered the castle gates. Looking up, he saw Sapphire. He stretched out his hand to her in joy and friendship. I would not be one of them, she added with a mocking laugh, as she dropped from the wall, leaped the moat by the help of her staff, and danced away laughing. There are those who say, however, that tears fell down her cheeks as she laughed. End of section 26、section、27 27of The Lane That Had No Turning This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker. The Singing of the Bees. Mother, didst thou not say thy prayers last night? Twice, my child. Once before the little shrine and once beside my bed. Is it not so? It is so, my Fanchon. What hast thou in thy mind? Thou didst pray that the storm die in the hills and the flood cease, and that my father come before it was again the hour of prayer. It is now the hour. Canst thou not hear the storm and the wash of the flood? And my father does not come. My Fanchon, God is good. When thou wast asleep, I rose from my bed, and in the dark I kissed the feet of him on the little calvary and i did not speak but in my heart i called what didst thou call my child i called to my father come back come back thou shouldst have called to god my fenchel i loved my father and i called to him thou shouldst love god i knew my father first if God loved thee, he would answer thy prayer. Dost thou not hear the cracking of the cedar trees and the cry of the wolves? They are afraid. All day and all night the rain and wind come down, and the birds and the wild fowl have no peace. I kissed his feet, and my throat was full of tears, but I called in my heart. Yet the storm and the dark stay, and my father does not come. Let us be patient, my Fenchon. He went to guide the priest across the hills. Why does not God guide him back? My Fenchon, let us be patient. The priest was young, and my father has gray hair. Wilt thou not be patient, my child? He filled the knapsack of the priest with food better than his own, and... Thou didst not see it. Put money in his hand. My own. The storm may pass. He told the priest to think upon our home as a little nest God set up here for such as he. There are places of shelter in the hills for thy father, my Fanchon. And when the priest prayed that thou may bring us safely to this place where we would go, my father said so softly, We beseech thee to hear us, good lord. My Fanchon, thy father hath gone this trail many times. The prayer was for the out trail, not the in trail, my mother. Nay, I do not understand thee. 
a swarm of bees came singing through the room last night my mother it was dark and i could not see but there was a sweet smell and i heard the voices my child thou art tired with watching and thy mind is full of fancies thou must sleep i am tired of watching through the singing of the bees as they passed over my bed i heard my father's voice i could not hear the words they seemed so far away like the voices of the bees and i did not cry out for the tears were in my throat after a moment the room was so still that it made my heart ache oh, my fashion my child thou dost break my heart dost thou not know the holy words and their souls do pass like singing bees where no man may follow these are they whom god gathereth out of the whirlwind and the desert and bringeth home in a goodly swarm night drew close to the earth and as suddenly as a sluice gate drops and holds back a flood the storm ceased along the crest of the hills there slowly grew a line of light and then the serene moon came up and on persistent to give the earth love where it had had punishment diverse flocks of clouds camp followers of the storm could not abash her but once she drew shrinking back behind a slow troop of them for down at the bottom of a gorge lay a mountaineer face upward and unmoving as he had lain since a rock loosened beneath him and the depths swallowed him if he had had ears to hear he would have answered the soft bitter cries which rose from a hut on the voshti hills above him michel michel art thou gone come back oh my father come back but perhaps it did avail that there were lighted candles before a little shrine and that a mother in her darkness kissed the feet of one on a calvary end of section 27section 28 of the lane that had no turning this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by eva davis the lane that had no turning and other tales concerning the people of pontiac by gilbert parker there was a little city it lay between the mountains and the sea and a river ran down past it carrying its good and ill news to a pacific shore and out upon soft winds travelling lazily to the scarlet east all white and a tempered red it nestled in a valley with other valleys on lower steps which seemed as if built by the gods that they might travel easily from the white-topped mountains margath shaknon and the rest to wash their feet in the sea in the summer a hot but gracious mistiness softened the green of the valleys the varying colours of the hills the blue of the river the sharp outlines of the cliffs along the high shelf of the mountain mule trains travelled like a procession seen in dreams slow hazy graven yet moving a part of the ancient hills themselves upon the river great rafts manned with scarlet vested crews swerved and swam guided by the gigantic oars which needed five men to lift and sway argonauts they from the sweet-smelling forests to the salt-smelling main in winter the little city lay still under a coverlet of pure white with the mists from the river and the great falls above frozen upon the trees clothing them as graciously as with white samite so that far as eye could see there was a heavenly purity upon all covering every mean and distorted thing there were days when no wind stirred anywhere and the gorgeous sun made the little city and all the land round about a pretty silver kingdom where oberon and his courtiers might have danced and been glad often too you could hear a distant woodcutter's axe make a pleasant song in the air and the woodcutter himself 
as the hickory and steel swung in a shining half circle to the bowl of balsam was clad in the bright livery of frost his breath issuing in gray smoke like life itself mystic and peculiar man axe tree and breath one common being and when by and by the woodcutter added a song of his own to the song his axe made the illusion was not lost but rather heightened for it too was part of the unassuming pride of nature childlike in its simplicity primeval in its suggestion and expression the song had a soft monotony swinging backwards and forwards to the waving axe like the pendulum of a clock it began with a low humming as one could think man made before he heard the voice which taught him how to speak and then came the words none shall stand in the way of the lord the lord of the earth of the rivers and trees of the cattle and fields and vines Whew. here shall i build me my cedar home a city with gates a road to the sea for i am the lord of the earth Whew. Whew. hue and hue and the sap of the tree shall be yours and your bones shall be strong shall be yours and your heart shall rejoice shall be yours and the city be yours and the key of its gates be the key of the home where your little ones dwell Whew, and be strong Whew, and rejoice for man is the lord of the earth and god is the lord over all and so long as the little city stands will the same woodcutter's name and history stand also he had camped where it stood now when nothing was there save the wild duck in the reeds the antelopes upon the hills and all manner of furred and feathered things and it all was his he had seen the yellow flashes of gold in the stream called pippi and he had not gathered it for his life was simple and he was young enough to cherish in his heart the love of the open world beyond the desire of cities and the stir of the market-place in those days there was not a line in his face not an angle in his body all smoothly rounded and lithe and alert like him that was called the young lion of Dedan. Day by day he drank in the wisdom of the hills and the valleys, and he wrote upon the dried barks of trees the thought that came as he lay upon the bearskin in his tent, or cooled his hands and feet of a hot summer day in the moist, sandy earth, and watched the master of the deer lead his cohorts down the passes of the hills. But by and by mule trains began to crawl along the ledges of Margath Mountain, and over Shacknong came adventurers, and after them wandering men seeking a new home, women and children coming also. But when these came he had passed the springtime of his years, and had grown fixed in the love of the valley, where his sole visitors had been passing tribes of Indians, who knew his moods and trespassed not at all on his domain. The adventurers hungered for the gold in the rivers, and they made it one long washing trough, where the disease that afflicted them passed on from man to man like poison down a sewer. Then the little city grew, and with the search for gold came other seekings and findings and toilings, and men who came, as one stops at an inn to feed, stayed to make their home, and women made the valley cheerful, and children were born, and the pride of the place was as great as that of some village of the crimson east where every man has ancestors to mohammed and beyond and he felion who had been lord and master of the valley worked with them but did not seek for riches and more often drew away into the hills to find some newer place unspoiled by man but again and again he returned for no fire is like the old fire and no trail like the old trail and at last it seemed as if he had driven his tent peg in the pippi valley forever for from among the women who came he chose one comely and wise and kind and for five years the world grew older and felion did not know it when he danced his little daughter on his knee he felt that he had found a new world but a day came when trouble fell upon the little city for of a sudden the reef of gold was lost and the great crushing mill stood idle and the sound of the hammers was stayed and they came to felion because in his youth he had been of the best of the schoolmen and he got up from his misery only the day before his wife had taken a great and lonely journey to that country which welcomes but never yields again and leaving his little child behind he went down to the mines 
and in three days they found the reef once more for it had curved like the hook of a sickle and the first arc of the yellow circle had dropped down into the bowels of the earth and so he saved the little city from disaster and the people blessed him at the moment and the years went on then there came a time when the little city was threatened with a woeful flood because of a breaking flume but by a simple and wise device Phelion stayed the danger and again the people blessed him and the years went on by and by an awful peril came for two score children had set a great raft loose upon the river and they drifted down towards the rapids in the sight of the people and mothers and helpless fathers wrung their hands for on the swift tide no boat could reach them and none could intercept the raft but Phelion, seeing ran out upon the girders of a bridge that was being builded and there before them all as the raft passed under he let himself fall breaking his leg as he dropped among the timbers of the forepart of the raft for the children were all gathered at the back where the great oars lay motionless one dragging in the water behind Phelion drew himself over to the huge oar and with the strength of five men while the people watched and prayed he kept the raft straight for the great slide else it had gone over the dam and been lost and all that were thereon a mile below the raft was brought to shore and again the people said that Phelion had saved the little city from disaster and they blessed him for the moment and the years went on Phelion's daughter grew towards womanhood and her beauty was great and she was welcome everywhere in the valley the people speaking well of her for her own sake but at last a time came when of the men of the valley one called and Phelion's daughter came quickly to him and with tears for her father and smiles for her husband she left the valley and journeyed into the east having sworn to love and cherish him while she lived and her father left solitary mourned for her and drew away into a hill above the valley in a cedar house that he built and having little else to love loved the earth and sky and animals and the children from the little city when they came his way but his heart was sore for by and by no letters came from his daughter and the little city having prospered concerned itself no more with him when he came into its streets there were those who laughed for he was very tall and rude and his gray hair hung loose on his shoulders and his dress was still a hunter's they had not long remembered the time when a grievous disease like a plague fell upon the place and people died by scores as sheep fall in a murren and again they had turned to him and he because he knew of a miraculous medicine got from indian sachems whose people had suffered of this sickness came into the little city and by his medicines and fearless love and kindness he stayed the plague and thus once more he saved the little city from disaster and they blessed him for the moment and the years went on in time they ceased to think of Phelion at all and he was left alone even the children came no more to visit him and he had pleasure only in hunting and shooting and in felling trees with which he built a high stockade and a fine cedar house within it and all the work of this he did with his own hands even to the polishing of the floors and the carved work of the large fireplaces yet he never lived in the house nor in any room of it and the stockade gate was always shut and when any people passed that way they stared and shrugged their shoulders and thought Phelion mad or a fool but he was wise in his own way which was not the way of those who had reason to bless him for ever and who forgot him though he had served them through so many years against the little city he had an exceeding bitterness and this grew and had it not been that his heart was kept young by the love of the earth and the beasts about him in the hills he must needs have cursed the place and died but the sight of a bird in the nest with her young and the smell of a lair and the light of the dawn that came out of the east and the winds that came up from the sea and the hope that would not die kept him from being of those who love not life for life's sake be it in ease or in sorrow he was of those who find all worth the doing even all worth the suffering and so though he frowned and his lips drew tight with anger when he looked down at the little city he felt that elsewhere in the world there was that which made it worth the saving 
if his daughter had been with him he would have laughed at that which his own hands had founded protected and saved but no word came from her and laughter was never on his lips only an occasional smile when perhaps he saw two sparrows fighting or watched the fish chase each other in the river or a toad too lazy to jump walk stupidly like a convict dragging his long green legs behind him and when he looked up towards shaknon and margath a light came into his eyes for they were wise and quiet and watched the world and something of their grandeur drew about him like a cloak as age cut deep lines in his face and gave angles to his figure a strange settled dignity grew upon him whether he swung his axe by the balsams or dressed the skins of the animals he had killed piling up the pelts in a long shed in the stockade a goodly heritage for his daughter if she ever came back every day at sunrise he walked to the door of his house and looked eastward steadily and sometimes there broke from his lips the words my daughter malise again he would sit and brood with his chin in his hand and smile as though remembering pleasant things one day at last in the full tide of summer a man haggard and troubled came to felion's house and knocked and getting no reply waited and whenever he looked down at the little city he wrung his hands and more than once he put them up to his face and shuddered and again looked for felion just when the dusk was rolling down felion came back and seeing the man would have passed him without a word but that the man stopped with an eager sorrowful gesture and said the plague has come upon us again and the people remembering how you healed them long ago beg you to come at that felion leaned his fishing-rod against the door and answered what people the other then replied the people of the little city below felion i do not know your name was the reply i know not of you or your city are you mad cried the man do you forget the little city down there have you no heart a strange smile passed over felion's face and he answered when one forgets why should the other remember he turned and went into the house and shut the door and though the man knocked the door was not opened and he went back angry and miserable and the people could not believe that felion would not come to help them as he had done all his life at dawn three others came and they found felion looking out towards the east his lips moving as though he prayed yet it was no prayer only a call that was on his lips they felt a sort of awe in his presence for now he seemed as if he had lived more than a century so wise and old was the look of his face so white his hair so set and distant his dignity they begged him to come and bringing his medicines save the people for death was galloping through the town knocking at many doors one came to heal you he answered the young man of the schools who wrote mystic letters after his name it swings on a brass by his door where is he he is dead of the plague they replied and the other also that came with him who fled before the sickness fell dead of it on the roadside going to the sea why should i go he replied and he turned threateningly to his weapon as if in menace of their presence you have no one to leave behind they answered eagerly and you are old liars he rejoined let the little city save itself and he wheeled and went into his house and they saw that they had erred in not remembering his daughter whose presence they had once prized they saw that they had angered him beyond soothing and they went back in grief for two of them had lost dear relatives by the fell sickness when they told what had happened the people said we will send the women he will listen to them he had a daughter that afternoon when all the hills lay still and dead and nowhere did bird or breeze stir the women came and they found him seated with his back turned to the town he was looking into the deep woods into the hot shadows of the trees we have come to bring you to the little city they said to him the sick grow in numbers every hour it is safe in the hills he answered not looking at them why do the people stay in the valley every man has a friend or a wife or a child ill or dying and every woman has a husband or a child or a friend or a brother cowards have fled 
and many of them have fallen by the way last summer i lay sick here many weeks and none came near me why should i go to the little city he replied austerely four times i saved it and of all that i saved none came to give me water to drink or food to eat and i lay burning with fever and thirsty and hungry god of heaven how thirsty we did not know they answered humbly you came to us so seldom we had forgotten we were fools i came and went fifty years he answered bitterly and i have forgotten how to rid the little city of the plague at that one of the women mad with anger made as if to catch him by his beard but she forbore and said liar the men shall hang you to your own roof tree his eyes had a wild light but he waved his hand quietly and answered be gone and learn how great a sin is ingratitude he turned away from them gloomily and would have entered his home but one of the women who was young plucked his sleeve and said sorrowfully i loved malise your daughter and forgot her and her father i am threescore and ten years and she has been gone fifteen and for the first time i see your face was his scornful reply she was tempted to say i was ever bearing children and nursing them and the hills were hard to climb and my husband would not go but she saw how dark his look was and she hid her face in her hands and turned away to follow after the others she had five little children and her heart was anxious for them and her eyes full of tears anger and remorse seized on the little city and there were those who would have killed phaleon but others saw that the old man had been sorely wronged in the past and these said wait until the morrow and we will devise something that night a mule train crept slowly down the mountainside and entered the little city for no one who came with them knew of the plague the caravan had come from the east across the great plains and not from the west which was the travelled highway to the sea among them was a woman who already was ill of a fever and knew not of what passed round her she had with her a beautiful child and one of the women of the place devised a thing this woman she said does not belong to the little city and he can have nothing against her she is a stranger let one of us take this beautiful lad to him and he shall ask phaleon to come and save his mother every one approved the woman's wisdom and in the early morning she herself with another took the child and went up the long hillside in the gross heat and when she came near phaleon's house the women stayed behind and the child went forward having been taught what to say to the old man phaleon sat just within his doorway looking out into the sunlight which fell upon the red and white walls of the little city flanked by young orchards with great oozy meadows beyond these where cattle ate knee-deep in the lush grass and cool reed beds along the riverside far up on the high banks were the tall couches of dead indians set on poles their useless weapons laid along the deerskin pall down the hurrying river there passed a raft bearing a black flag on a pole and on it were women and children who were being taken down to the sea from the doomed city these were they who had lost fathers and brothers and now were going out alone with the shadow of the plague over them for there was none to say them nay the tall oarsmen bent to their task and phaleon felt his blood beat faster when he saw the huge oars swing high then drop and bend in the water as the raft swung straight in its course and passed on safe through the narrow slide into the white rapids below which licked the long timbers as with white tongues and tossed spray upon the sad voyagers phaleon remembered the day when he left his own child behind and sprang from the bridge to the raft whereon were the children of the little city and saved them and when he tried to be angry now the thought of the children as they watched him with his broken legs striving against their peril softened his heart he shook his head for suddenly there came to him the memory of a time threescore years before when he and the foundryman's daughter had gone hunting flag flowers by the little trout stream of the songs they sang together at the festivals she in her sweet quaker garb and demure quaker beauty 
he lithe alert and full of the joy of life and loving as he sat so thinking he wondered where she was and why he should be thinking of her now facing the dreary sorrow of this pestilence and his own anger and vengeance he nodded softly to the waving trees far down in the valley for his thoughts had drifted on to his wife as he first saw her she was standing bare-armed among the grapevines by a wall of rock the dew of rich life on her lip and forehead her grey eyes swimming with a soft light and looking at her he had loved her at once as he had loved on the instant the little child that came to him later as he had loved the girl into which the child grew till she left him and came back no more why had he never gone in search of her he got to his feet involuntarily and stepped towards the door looking down into the valley as his eyes rested on the little city his face grew dark but his eyes were troubled and presently grew bewildered for out of a green covert near there stepped a pretty boy who came to him with frank unabashed face and a half-shy smile felion did not speak at first but stood looking and presently the child said i have come to fetch you to fetch me where little man asked felion a light coming into his face his heart beating faster to my mother she is sick where is your mother she's in the village down there answered the boy pointing in spite of himself felion smiled in a sour sort of way for the boy had called the place a village and he relished the unconscious irony what is the matter with her asked felion beckoning the lad inside the lad came and stood in the doorway gazing round curiously while the old man sat down and looked at him moved he knew not why the bright steel of felion's axe standing in the corner caught the lad's eye and held it felion saw and said what are you thinking of the lad answered of the axe when i'm bigger i will cut down trees and build a house a bridge and a city aren't you coming quick to help my mother she will die if you don't come felion did not answer and from the trees without two women watched him anxiously why should i come asked felion curiously because she's sick and she's my mother why should i do it because she's your mother i don't know the lad answered and his brow knitted in the attempt to think it out but i like you he came and stood beside the old man and looked into his face with a pleasant confidence if your mother was sick and i could heal her i would i know i would i wouldn't be afraid to go down into the village here were rebuke love and impeachment all in one and the old man half started from his seat did you think i was afraid he asked of the boy as simply as might a child of a child so near are children and wise men in their thoughts i knew if you didn't it'd be because you were angry or were afraid and you didn't look angry how does one look when one is angry like my father and how does your father look my father's dead did he die of the plague asked felion laying his hand on the lad's shoulder no said the lad quickly and shut his lips tight won't you tell me asked felion with a strange inquisitiveness no mother'll tell you but i won't and the lad's eyes filled with tears poor boy poor boy said felion and his hand tightened on the small shoulder don't be sorry for me be sorry for mother please said the boy and he laid a hand on the old man's knee and that touch went to a heart long closed against the little city below and felion rose and said i will go with you to your mother then he went into another room and the boy came near the axe and ran his fingers along the bright steel and fondled the handle as does a hunter the tried weapon which has been his through many seasons when the old man came back he said to the boy why do you look at the axe i don't know was the answer maybe because my mother used to sing a song about the woodcutters without a word and thinking much he stepped out into the path leading to the little city the lad holding one hand 
years afterwards men spoke with a sort of awe or reverence of seeing the beautiful stranger lad leading old felion into the plague-stricken place and how as they passed women threw themselves at felion's feet begging him to save their loved ones and a drunkard cast his arm round the old man's shoulder and sputtered foolish pleadings into his ear but felion only waved them back gently and said by and by by and by god help us all now a fevered hand snatched at him from a doorway meanings came from everywhere and more than once he almost stumbled over a dead body others he saw being carried away to the graveyard for hasty burial few were the mourners who followed and the faces of those who watched the processions go by were set and drawn the sunlight in the green tree seemed an insult to the dead they passed into the house where the sick woman lay and some met him at the door with faces of joy and meaning for now they knew the woman and would have spoken to him of her but he waved them off and put his fingers upon his lips and went where a fire burned in the kitchen and brewed his medicines and the child entered the room where his mother lay and presently he came to the kitchen and said she is asleep my mother the old man looked down on him a moment steadily and a look of bewilderment came into his face but he turned away again to the simmering pots the boy went to the window and leaning upon the sill began to hum softly a sort of chant while he watched a lizard running hither and thither in the sun as he hummed the old man listened and presently with his medicines in his hands and a half startled look he came over to the lad what are you humming he asked the lad answered a song of the woodcutters sing it again said felion the lad began to sing here shall i build me my cedar house a city with gates a road to the sea for i am the lord of the earth the old man stopped him what is your name my name is felion answered the lad and he put his face close to the jug that held the steaming tinctures but the old man caught the little chin in his huge hand and bent back the head looking long into the lad's eyes at last he caught little felion's hand and hurried into the other room where the woman lay in a stupor the old man came quickly to her and looked into her face seeing he gave a broken cry and said malise my daughter malise he drew her to his breast and as he did so he groaned aloud for he knew that an inevitable death was waiting for her at the door he straightened himself up clasped the child to his breast and said i too am felion my little son and then he set about to defeat that dark hovering figure at the door for three long hours he sat beside her giving her little by little his potent medicines and now and again he stopped his mouth with his hand lest he should cry out and his eyes never wavered from her face not even to the boy who lay asleep in the corner at last his look relaxed its vigilance for a dewy look passed over the woman's face and she opened her eyes and saw him and gave a little cry of father and was straightway lost in his arms i have come home to die she said no no to live he answered firmly why did you not send me word all these long years my husband was in shame in prison and i in sorrow she answered sadly i could not he is he paused he did evil he is dead she said it is better so her eyes wandered round the room restlessly and then fixed upon the sleeping child and a smile passed over her face she pointed to the lad the old man nodded he brought me here he said gently then he got to his feet you must sleep now he added and he gave her a cordial i must go forth and save the sick is it a plague she asked he nodded they said you would not come to save them she continued reproachfully you came to me because i was your malice only for that no no he answered i knew not who you were i came to save a mother to her child thank god my father she said with a smile she hid her face in the pillow 
at last leaving her and the child asleep old phaleon went forth into the little city and the people flocked to him and for many days he came and went ceaselessly and once more he saved the city and the people blessed him and the years go on End of section 28section twenty nine of the lane that had no turning this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo and eva davis the lane that had no turning and other tales concerning the people of pontiac by gilbert parker the forge in the valley he lay where he could see her working at the forge as she worked she sang when god was making the world swift is the wind and white is the fire the feet of his people danced the stars there was laughter and swinging bells and clanging iron and breaking bread the hammers of heaven making the hills the veils on the anvil of god wild is the fire and low is the wind his eyes were shining and his face had a pale radiance from the reflected light though he lay in the shadow where he could watch her while she could not see him now her hand was upon the bellows and the low white fire seethed hungrily up and set its teeth upon the iron she held now it turned the iron about upon the anvil and the sparks showered about her very softly and strangely. There was a cheerful gravity in her motions, a high, fine look in her face. They, too, lived alone in the solitudes of Megalon Valley. It was night now, and the pleasant gloom of the valley was not broken by any sound save the hum of the stream nearby, and the song in the ringing anvil. But into the workshop came the moist, fragrant smell of the acacia and the maple and a long brown lizard stretched its neck sleepily across the threshold of the door opening into the valley the song went on when god had finished the world bright was the fire and sweet was the wind up from the valleys came song to answer the morning stars and the hand of man on the anvil rang his breath was big in his breast his life beat strong on the walls of the world glad is the wind and tall is the fire he put his hands to his eyes and took them away again as if to make sure that the song was not a dream wonder grew upon his thin bearded face he ran his fingers through his thick hair in a dazed way then he lay and looked, and a rich, warm flush crept over his cheek and stayed there. There was a great gap in his memory. The evening wore on. Once or twice the woman turned towards the room where the man lay and listened. She could not see his face from where she stood. At such times he lay still, though his heart beat quickly, like that of an expectant child. His lips opened to speak but still they remained silent as yet he was like a returned traveller who does not quickly recognize old familiar things and who is struggling with vague suggestions and forgotten events as time went on the woman turned towards the doorway oftener and shifted her position so that she faced it and the sparks flying up lighted her face with a wonderful irregular brightness samantha he said at last, and his voice sounded so strange to him that the word quivered timidly towards her. She paused upon a stroke, and some new note in his voice sent so sudden a thrill to her heart that she caught her breath with a painful kind of joy. The hammer dropped upon the anvil, and in a moment she stood in the doorway of his room. Francis, Francis she said in a low whisper he started up from his couch of skins samantha my wife 
he cried in a strong, proud voice. She dropped beside him and caught his head like a mother to her shoulder and set her warm lips on his forehead and hair with a kind of hunger. Then he drew her face down and kissed her on the lips. Tears hung in her eyes and presently dropped on her cheeks. A sob shook her, and then she was still, her hands grasping his shoulders. Have I been ill? he said. You have been very ill, Francis. Has it been long? Her fingers passed tenderly through his grizzled hair. Too long, too long, my husband, she replied. Is it summer now? Yes, Francis, it is summer. Was it in the spring, Samantha? Yes, I think it was in the spring, he added, musing. It was in the spring. There was snow still on the mountain top. The river was running high, and wildfowl were gathered on the island in the lake. Yes, I remember, I think. And the men were working at the mine, she whispered, her voice shaking a little, and her eyes eagerly questioning his face. Ah, the mine! It was the mine, Samantha, he said abruptly, his eyes flashing up. I was working at the forge to make a great bolt for the machinery, and someone forgot and set the engine in motion. I ran out, but it was too late, and then— And then you tried to save them, Francis, and you were hurt. What month is this, my wife? It is December. And that was in October? Yes, in October. I've been ill since. What happened? Many were killed, Francis, and you and I came away. Where are we now? I do not know the place. This is Megalon Valley. You and I live alone here. Why did you bring me here? I did not bring you, Francis. You wished me to come. One day you said to me, There is a place in Megalon Valley where, long ago, an old man lived, who had become a stranger among men. A place where the blackbird stays, and the wolf-dog troops and hides, and the damson grows as thick as blossoms on the acacia tree. We will go there. And I came with you. I do not remember, my wife. What of the mine? Was I a coward and left the mine? There was no one understood the ways of the wheel and rod and steam but me. The mine is closed, Francis, she answered gently. You were no coward, but, but you had strange fancies. When did the mine close? He said with a kind of sorrow. I put hard work and good years into it. At that moment, when her face drew close to his, the vision of her as she stood at the anvil came to him with a new impression, and he said again in a half-frightened way, When did it close, Samantha? The mine was closed twelve years ago, my husband. He got to his feet and clasped her to his breast. A strength came to him which had eluded him twelve years, and she, womanlike, delighted in that strength, and, with a great gladness, changed eyes and hands with him, keeping her soul still her own, brooding and lofty, as is the soul of every true woman, though, like this one, she labors at a forge and in a far, untenanted country, is faithful friend, ceaseless apothecary to a comrade with a disordered mind, living on savage meats clothing herself and the other in skins, and, with a divine persistence, keeping a cheerful heart, certain that the intelligence which was frightened from its home would come back one day. It should be hers to watch for the great moment and give the wanderer loving welcome, lest it should hurry madly away again into the desert, never to return. She had her reward, yet she wept. She had carried herself before him, 
with the bright ways of an unvexed girl these twelve years past she had earned the salt of her tears he was dazed still but the doublet of his mind no longer embraced he understood what she had been to him and how she had tended him in absolute loneliness her companions the wild things of the valley these and god he drew her into the workshop and put his hand upon the bellows and churned them so that the fire roared joyously up and the place was red with the light in this light he turned her to him and looked at her the look was that of one who had come back from the dead that naked profound unconditional gaze which is as deep and honest as the primeval sense his eyes fell upon her rich firm stately body it lingered for a moment on the brown fullness of her hair then her look was gathered to his and they fell into each other's arms for long they sat in the solemn silence of their joy and so awed were they by the thing which had come to them that they felt no surprise when a wolf-dog crawled over the lizard on the threshold and stole along the wall with shining bloody eyes to an inner room and stayed there munching meat to surfeit and drowsiness and at last crept out and lay beside the forge in a thick sleep these two had lived so much with the untamed things of nature the bellows and the fire had been so long there and the clang of the anvil was so familiar that there was a kinship among them man and beast with a woman as ruler tell me my wife he said at last what has happened during those twelve years all from the first keep nothing back i am strong now he looked around the workshop then suddenly at her with a strange pain and they both turned their heads away for an instant for the same thought was on them then presently she spoke and answered his shy sorrowful thought before all else the child is gone she softly said he sat still but a sob was in his throat he looked at her with a kind of fear he wondered if his madness had cost the life of the child she understood did i ever see the child he said oh yes i sometimes thought that through the babe you would be yourself again when you were near her you never ceased to look at her and fondle her as i thought very timidly and you would start sometimes and gaze at me with the old wise look hovering at your eyes but the look did not stay the child was fond of you but she faded and pined and one day as you nursed her you came to me and said see my wife the little one will not wake she pulled at my beard and said daddy and fell asleep and i took her from your arms there is a chestnut tree near the door of our cottage at the mine one night you and i buried her there but you do not remember her do you my child my child he said looking out into the night and he lifted up his arms and looked at them i held her here and still i never held her i fondled her and yet i never fondled her i buried her yet to me she was never born you have been far away francis you have come back home i waited and prayed and worked with you and was patient it is very strange she continued in all these twelve years you cannot remember our past though you remembered about this place the one thing as if god had made it so and now you cannot remember those twelve years tell me now of the twelve years he urged it was the same from day to day when we came from the mountain we brought with us the implements of the forge upon a horse now and again as we travelled we cut our way through the heavy woods you were changed for the better then a dreadful trouble seemed to have gone from your face there was a strong kind of peace in the valley and there were so many birds and animals and the smell of the trees was so fine 
that we were not lonely, neither you nor I. She paused, thinking, her eyes looking out to where the evening star was sailing slowly out of the wooded horizon. His look on her. In the pause, the wolf dog raised its big, sleepy eyes at them, then plunged its head into its paws, its wildness undisturbed by their presence. Presently, the wife continued. At last, we reached here, and here we have lived, where no human being save one has ever been. We put up the forge, and in a little hill not far away, we found coal for it. The days went on. It was always summer, though there came at times a sharp frost and covered the ground with a coverlet of white. But the birds were always with us, and the beasts were our friends. I learned to love even the shrill cry of the reed hens, and the soft tap-tap of the woodpecker is the sweetest music to my ear after the song of the anvil. How often have you and I stood here at the anvil? the fire heating the iron, and our hammers falling constantly. Oh, my husband, I knew that only here with God and his dumb creatures and his wonderful healing world, all sun and wind and flowers and blossoming trees, working as you used to work, as the first of men worked, with the sane wandering soul returned to you. The thought was in you, too, for you led me here, and have been patient also in the awful exile of your mind. I have been as a child, and not as a man, he said gravely. Shall I ever again be a man, as I once was, Samantha? You cannot see yourself, she said. A week ago you fell ill, and since then you have been pale and worn. But your body has been, and is, that of a great strong man. In the morning I will take you to a spring in the hills, and you shall see yourself, my husband. He stood up, stretched himself, went to the door, and looked out into the valley flooded with moonlight. He drew in a great draught of air and said, The world, the great wonderful world, where men live and love work and do strong things. He paused and turned with a trouble in his face. My wife, he said, you have lived with a dead man twelve years, and I have lost twelve years in the world. I had a great thought once, an invention, but now he hung his head bitterly. She came to him, and her hand slid up along his breast to his shoulders, and rested there, and she said with a glad smile, Francis, you have lost nothing. The thing, the invention, was all but finished when you fell ill a week ago. We have worked at it for these twelve years. Through it, I think, you have been brought back to me. Come, there is a little work yet to do upon it. And she drew him to where a machine of iron lay in the corner. With a great cry, he fell upon his knees beside it and fondled it. Then presently he rose and caught his wife to his breast. Together, a moment after, they stood beside the anvil. The wolf-dog fled out into the night from the shower of sparks, as in the red light the two sang to the clanging of the hammers. When God was making the world Swift is the wind and white is the fire. End of section 26. End of the lane that had no turning. In other tales concerning the people of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker.